freedom. It's something we cherish in this country. The idea of a free society is embedded into the very core of our nation. Many have died defending it, and many have fought diligently to preserve it. So where has it gone? We've become a nation bound by division, chained by hatred, and consumed by selfishness. There's an epidemic of violence, poverty, brokenness. Does this look like freedom? The Bible tells us we're called to be free, but it also says to use that freedom to serve one another humbly, in love. Maybe that's what we're missing in America. Today, we celebrate Independence Day. Perhaps it's time we recognize that true independence is found only in a lasting dependence on God. For where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. Well, uh, I would first off challenge anybody to be a dad and uh, sit here. Whoever's idea was to throw that skit up there and then to hear you pray and then do all that stuff. I'm like, you gotta keep this together, big guy. Like, keep yourself in check. Um, first off, quick bio myself, Jason Hoffman, uh, beautiful wife, Danielle, four kids, Emma, Liv, Jax, uh, Jace, awesome family. Um, super, super, super blessed. Great town, just, the things that I get to be involved with, um, I try to be as humble as I possibly can. Uh, so a lot of pressure associated with uh, what Anthony and Jimmy place on my shoulders a little bit. But as I start, start thinking about having the opportunity to come uh, and speak today for graduates, I feel like uh, I, I start talking to myself, I'm like, you're a principal guy, this is a slam dunk, this is what you do, get it done. Um, the work that God has done in the last 48 hours has been super stressful. Um, just, you sit there, you let them figure things out, you say, hey, this is what I need you to do, and you sit and you just kind of wait. So, uh, I had everything ready to rock and roll, we're going to talk about perseverance, we're going to talk about accomplishments, successes, the fact that you did it, and all that great stuff, and then I realized that's actually probably a lie. Um, the school's job is to tell you that stuff. Um, the fact of the matter is, this is a huge milestone for graduates. It is. It is a giant first step. But as I started to stop and reflect on what it is or what it actually means, is that you have like, you know, ideally, realistically, 60 to 70, 70 more years of your life uh, to experience. And with that being said, I would hope the graduates sitting here would be like, what is he talking about? 60 to 70 years, that's not even like relatable. Uh, I can't even fathom that. And then I talk about the people in my age bracket where we're like, wow, that, I've done half that. Um, I've been in this church for like 30 years and I feel like I'm 18 still. And then there's the other third where the time that I said 60 to 70 years, your life kind of just flashed in front of your eyes and you're sitting here thinking, where did this all go? And here I am, right? So I wanted something to talk about today that doesn't just benefit graduates, but it also benefits everybody else that had the opportunity to come and listen today. Um, and I've always said this, I'm, I'm certainly not a pastor. I'm you know, not uh, an expert in much of anything. I'm a pretty simple guy. I make tons of mistakes. But I know when I make mistakes, whether I think I'm in control or if I'm completely out of control, I need that I know that I need to go back to God uh, and just get right um, with him and let him kind of take over and do the things that I need him to do. So as I thought about this, I think the theme for today was fairly easy. Um, I want the graduates, I would like for everyone in here to just, it's a, it's a simple favor. It's something that anybody can do. And it's just allowing yourself to be who God intended you to be. That's it. Very simple. Just be what God intends you to be. Now, that was easy. 
because the assumption is that we're all working, we're praying, we're living to be who God wants us to be. I don't necessarily want to focus today on the lessons of how we do that, but more importantly, what we do that prevents us from allowing God to be who we intend to be. And that's where I've been stuck for two weeks. Um, you know, our house, it's the coming and going. Our family's weird. We admit it. We're, it's, it's how it works. At any given time on a random Tuesday night, there's 17 people flying around somebody's house. That's just what we do. Um, I'm out on the porch the other day. Some people are everywhere. Rochelle comes pulling up and I'm out there just feverishly having these random bullet points flying through my head and I'm quickly trying to write these things down to capture them. And I was just, I feel like sometimes my head is like a field full of rabbits. <laughs> it's just like <laughs> everywhere, right? Um, so I spend 10 hours a week just driving in a car at a minimum. I drive an hour to work, I drive an hour back. I use that time to reflect, I use that time to kind of plan things, I use that time to ask for forgiveness for all the things that are happening on my way to work. Um, I'm typically uh, passing you if I see you, so I'm sorry. Um, and at that time, I'm usually just windows down, elevation worship, singing to the top of my lungs, getting my principal groove on. Next thing I know, it's an 80s hairband song that flies on and I'm singing it or I'm listening to sermons or I'm watching a podcast with Jordan Peterson and I've got ADHD like it's nobody's business and my brain just works and works and works and works. Um, so in, in typical God fashion, when you sit there and you say, hey, this is what I want to do, he typically is like, eh, uh, maybe a little bit more. So when I sat here and I thought, you know what, I have this, it's done, I have the speech, um, I wasn't even close to having the speech. Um, it actually began Thursday. So I'm going to let you into a little bit of a glimpse of my life, right? So um, I'm doing that singing thing, heading to work. Uh, I get a text, transportation coordinator, hey, there's a fight in bus 44, it'll be there in 15 minutes, I need you to get there and get these kids off the bus. Got it. I'll be there in like seven minutes. So I'm good, flying. This is like 6.50 in the morning, right? And I'm thinking, who fights at 6.50 in the morning? Like, I can't, I can't deal with this right now. So back to my jam. I'm, I'm getting ready to roll into Butler. Phone rings. She's like, I'm sorry. There's a fight off the bus now, but it's in the circle. I was like, all right, got this. Call my assistant, I'm like, hey, meet me out in the circle. I'm gonna rope up some kids. We're gonna march them in, make a spectacle of everybody because this is the last week of school this week. So I wanna kind of like make sure everyone sees what's happening. So I walk in, uh, actually I'm standing there. Um, I said to the kid who kind of was like doing the thing, I'm like, what's going on? He's like, I'm just worried. I was like, well, what are you worried about? He's like, kid threw something at me last week. He got on Snapchat. And I'm worried about what they're gonna say. So I just said to myself, when I see him, I'm gonna pop him in the face. So good news is he listens to himself. Bad news is he takes bad advice from himself. Um, so I'm walking up, one on my left, one on my right, and I said, you guys know what this is? And they're like, it's a cup of coffee. I said, yeah, if you wanna see Mr. Huffman without a cup of coffee in him, at seven in the morning, you two will start talking to each other. And if you talk to each other, Non-coffee Mr. Huffman's gonna go nuts. So they were just, whoop. all right, we walk in, get into the office. There's a mom sitting there. My secretary was giving me the eyeballs to like uh, walk away, get away. As soon as I walk in, she's yelling at me. My son's not graduating. What are you gonna do about it? Hang on, just have a seat. I go in, take out my computer. I sit down to start processing the kids. My computer makes the sound of what would be like a dying walrus, I think, right? It's just this, and then the smoke. Uh, and then from the smoke, I realized my computer blew up. So I call IT, and I'm like, I need a loaner 10 minutes ago. And then you go through this state. If anybody's in IT, I apologize. There's stereotypes associated with you. So I call, and she's like, what's wrong? That's, that's why I'm calling you. Um, she's like, well, what's it doing? And I'm like, 
could you just leave your office, come down, take this thing, bring me a loaner, and we're good to go. I can hear mom escalating in the office. The kid's really worried. I call home, I talk to mom, I do that. It's eight o'clock, 8.15, I have a meeting with department chairs, breaking all the bad news about the fact that they're all gonna be moving out of their classrooms and who gets new classrooms, and the seniority says someone should have a window or air conditioning. And I have that going on, I bring mom in, we sit down, we start talking, my phone rings and rings and rings and rings and rings. It's the nurse, she's like, hey, I need you up here now. There's a kid under the influence in the nurse's office. I'm like, again, who does this at eight o'clock in the morning? Apparently everybody in Butler. <laughs> so uh, I'm sitting there and I'm like, well, who is it? And I just start laughing. It's her kid who's sitting across the desk from me. And I was like, how about we take a walk real quick? I wanna show you something. We go up, deal with her son. Moral of the story is uh, I had to have a speech ready at nine o'clock for a special education graduation ceremony. Um, I did not have one ready because it was busy that week. So I figured, hey, the kids are doing this. I'm going to do it. Uh, I got on to uh, chat GTP, a little AI, right? <laughs> I typed in graduation speech, two minutes long. Boom. There it was. It's great. It was awesome. I get down, uh, roll in there. It starts at 9 o'clock. It's 8.59. I get in. I go down. I have a seat. And that's where he started. He just started. I'm stirring. I'm emotional, um, I'm watching these 15 graduates, uh, and it's, a, it's an amazing ceremony, auditorium full, 15 students in special education, they're all crying, they're all consoling each other, we do videos of them thanking their families, it's just this amazing deal, and then I, like if you saw me, I'm just sitting over there stirring in my seat. So I take my chat GTP and I'm like, all right, whatever. I know that's what you're telling me, don't read it. So I didn't read it. And I just sat there and I just said, all right, I'm super worried, take this thing over. Let's, let's, let's do this. So we go through it, they get to me, I look over, um, and it's just this overwhelming sense of worry that you see in these kids' faces, because uh, they don't know what's happening. Um, I'm 46 and I'm supposed to have it together and I was worried, because I didn't know what was happening. So I get up there and I just do what I do, and it worked out great. Um, it was awesome. Uh, I was crying, they were crying, everybody was crying. It was great. When it was done, and I had this opportunity to talk about worry, um, we were having like a little dinner for everybody and this mother comes over and she's like, hey, I'm Aiden's mom. Aiden's kind of the coolest cat in the building. Um, he's 20 years old, he knows everybody, he's a social butterfly, he is just awesome to be around. He cried the entire ceremony, the entire thing, from the time he sat down to the time that he left. She says, you know, I couldn't help but share with you. Last night, we're sitting there, I'm trying to iron his robe and everything, and he's out in the yard and he's yelling, mom, 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 and she's yelling at him back at him. And she said, I walked out, he sit there, he put his arm around me, he looks up and he's like, isn't he beautiful? That's all he said to her, isn't he beautiful? looking at the stars and the sky. And she's like, you know, I was so worried about today. You said what you said. He said what he said last night. And it's amazing how God will work in different people to bring them together for a moment, to be able to share. Who, someone I'll probably not speak to again, um, or see. So that's, that's kind of where it, it began. Um, I believe the one thing that God that prevents us from being who God wants us to be is worry. It's worry. God does not want us to worry. Uh, I, I mean, he doesn't want us to worry about anything. Like, zero zip, nada, nothing. And that's very hard to do. Philippians 4, 6 says, don't worry about anything, just pray about everything. We're either praying or panicking, we're either worshiping or worrying. That's just what we do. That's where we're at. God says don't worry. Why? Because it's unreasonable, it's irrational, it's unnatural, it's worthless, worry doesn't make sense. Typically we're worrying about all the wrong stuff. We're worried about clothes, times, schedules, laundry, when we're going to eat, who likes us, who doesn't like us, 
Worry is not helpful. It changes nothing. It fixes nothing. Matthew 6, 27 tells us that by worrying, no person has ever added a single hour to their day. Nothing. Worry doesn't make you taller, thinner, cuter, you know, more comfortable, richer. It does none of those things. Worry is simply something that cannot change the past. It can't, contrain, it can't control the future. And most importantly, it just really messes up today. Is all worry is. When you look at young children, they don't worry about anything. There's nothing. I love it how Pastor Jimmy always says, I love hearing babies cry in church. It's a sign of a grown church. It is. But at the same time, I tried reflecting, like, what did I worry about when I was a kid? I didn't worry about anything. My mom and my dad had all the worries that I should have had, right? So, you know, I, should, I apologize to them for making you worry because we're not supposed to worry, right? But at the same time, when we take a look at those children, it's really truly who we need to be. They are very comfortable being them. And I sat and I was talking to Olivia when you look up here and you see who's participating and not participating and singing little church songs. And it's one of those things. It's like, when all of a sudden did the world take control of us? When all of a sudden did we start worrying and worrying about what other people think of us and why we can't express ourselves and be who we are and share the word of God and say the things that we want to say? I don't know when that happens, but if there's any advice I can give graduates or anyone else, check the worry at the front door. Just let it go. We give those things to God. Once I started doing this, I began to realize that worry is just absolutely nonsense. Um, now, obviously, we still have to do our part. We have to plan and we have to be concerned. Um, we can't say, man, I really want that job and then just say, hey, God, give it to me and not even apply for the job. Right. You have to, you have to be in a position to do your part. But when you begin to worry, you take the emotion and you take God out of that relationship. And then for some of us, what's it create? It creates sadness, it creates us being mad, it creates uh, us being anxious and depressed and aggressive and defensive. Uh, these are all just simply emotions of the devil. It's what it is. Here's a simple example. We have to be somewhere. We're running late. We're worried about being there. We start yelling. We're trying to light a fire under somebody's butt. We get out the door. We say mean things. We say hurtful things. We rush out the door. We break every speed limit getting there. And when we get there, we're like 10 minutes early. Or whatever we were rushing for, it never started. Or in some cases, it got canceled. So we've placed all of these worries and have done all of these things to get to the point where in the end it doesn't really matter. But it's changed that moment. It's changed how people think of us. It's changed how we think of other people. We've said and done things that are somewhat hurtful, and then we have to recover from that. Don't worry, and just give that stuff to God, because in the end, it doesn't really matter. I would assume that everyone here is a believer in God. We've accepted salvation, which means that Jesus took care of our biggest problem for us by dying on the cross. He's taken care of that for us. So we have trusted God with the biggest decision in our life, that committing to him and accepting his grace and having a place in heaven. So why in the world would we not give him this tough meeting we have coming up? Or this new job prospect? Or we're running late to work? Or we're not going to make it to a meeting? Or my kids? Or the stress of cancer? Or the stress of sickness? He's taken care of absolutely the biggest deal in your life by giving you an opportunity at salvation, yet we don't trust him with the small stuff, the everyday little things. And like I said, when that changed, and I've said it before, and I'm like, ah, I'm not worried, I'm just going to pray. That's all I'm going to do. I'm just going to pray about it. But you still have to kind of do your part. So we're worried about what school we need to go to, what's school going to look like, what job am I going to get? Where am I going to live? Meetings, bills, relationships. I told you this week, um, I just kind of let God start doing his thing. Um, told you Thursday, Friday rolls around. I have a colleague at work. Um, I worked with her for a number of years. Um, I actually convinced her to quit her job to come working for me um, three or four years ago. 
And in that, she comes into my office. Um, she's asking me about a student, needs to graduate, because that's the conversation now. Everybody feels like they have to pay attention to graduating the week before graduation and do a year's worth of work in two days. So we're sitting there talking, uh, and she just starts, she starts crying. And I'm like, uh-oh. I'm like, uh, so I get up, I close the door. I go, what's going on? She's like, I'm worried. She's like, I am worried. I'm like, what are you worried about? And she couldn't formulate words. She was so worked up. And she says, um, I'm worried that I'm about to disappoint you. All right. What are, what are you going to disappoint me about? She says, I leave here every day completely discouraged. I don't know if what I'm doing is what I'm supposed to be doing. I feel like I'm supposed to help and fix these kids, but I'm stuck behind paperwork. I'm finding ways for kids to graduate. Um, it's a rough gig. Very rarely does someone in the educational world get a phone call and someone tell you how great you are. Um, they normally call and tell you what a horrible person you are and how you're ruining their lives or your children's lives. That's the norm. She's like, I've been given an opportunity in this other practice that I'm with at a full-time job. And I don't know what to do, I'm worried. So I'm sitting there really trying to be compassionate, but I can't discard the fact. I'm like, here you go again. Worried, it keeps coming up over and over and over again. Worried, worried, worried. And this is the general theme that started happening of what it is that I need to have a conversation about. And I stopped and I looked at him and I said, hey, I don't know what your deal is, but can we just pray together real quick? Like, let's just pray. I said, because at this point, if you're worried about disappointing me, you're not. <laughs> I'm impossible to disappoint. I just want to help is really what I'm about. So I said, let's pray about this and then we'll have a conversation. And then from there, we're just going to talk about what's in your best interest. What, what do you need to do? I said, and we're going to solve the last three weeks to months of your life stressing in about 15 seconds. So we prayed, we had a conversation and we talked and she's like, um, I don't know why anybody would not want to work for you. And I can't figure out why in the world I feel like I need to leave. And I said, because it's just not, it's just not what's supposed to happen. I said, it's fine. She's like, I want to learn from you more. There's still, there's still things. I said, that's fine. It is. But what's in the best interest of your family? What's in the best interest of you? And we need to remove things that we're worried about. And if this place is creating worry, we need to change it. And I'm going to text her a phone call away. And we talked a little bit more and she left and I closed the door and I started writing different things. I'm like, how? Again, just amazed at how when you stop and focus on something and you say, here you go, take this. And he takes it, but it's when he's ready to give it to you. So John 14, one says, just don't be worried. Believe in God. I heard this term that I thought was very interesting. Um, and when I applied it to the things in my life that I really work hard not to worry about, it's very true. Um, they say the worst place to be as a believer is in God's waiting room. What God's waiting room is, is we take all of our worries, whichever ones we have, we give those up to God and we're like, here you go. I'm worried about this relationship. I'm worried about this thing at work. I'm worried, I'm worried, I'm worried, I'm worried. We get over to him and then what happens? We wait and then we wait and then we wait. And then what do we do? Oh, I feel like you're a pretty busy guy. So I'm just gonna like take this one back a little bit because I need an answer like yesterday. So I feel like I need to hurry up and figure this thing out. And what's he do? Pumps the brakes. You're not, you're, you're not in control with this. So you will either have to continue to wait or your solutions will fail and fail and fail miserably. How many of you have spent years praying for a person to no avail? I would love for my husband to come to church. 
you pray and you pray and you pray. And then some days it just happens. It's just this thing that happens. They show up and it works. And it's everything you've been waiting for. Or you pray and you pray and you pray for your kids. And then all of a sudden, whether it's them just growing up or they're starting to figure things out, it happens. So when we place those worries in that God's waiting room and we look to take those things back, it's going to fail every single time. I can guarantee you it's going to fail. So you are in God's waiting room. You just wait. You wait for him. You give it up. You plan. You be, you be concerned. You work towards it. You try to improve it. You have conversations, but you just wait for him to do his thing because he will do what he does. When we begin to remove God from solutions, we invite worry into our lives. I like things very simple. Today is not simple. Graduates, I don't want to be you. <laughs> I don't. You, you want some worry trigger words? Ready? Here we go. Inflation, gas prices, gender, 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 racism, 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 right? Uh, politics, division, conflict, crime, media, right? Some of you are sitting here like, ah. like it's just sending an herb. That is just a fraction of what we have to worry about a fraction so thinking of that might make you worried but then what do we do with that any area of our life that we place higher than god will become a source of worry for us it's guaranteed this is kind of where the rubber meets the road for me um, i love my wife i love my kids my family's amazing um, but they are my sole area of worry Soul area of worry for a nine million reasons. And I'm a work in progress, as I've always said. So I got to find a way to put God in front of my family. And that's a hard pill to swallow. And if you want to try it, <clears throat> right? If you want to try this, download Life 360. Okay? Mom, I don't know how you live life without Life 360. Because I thought not knowing where my kids are at would be stressful. But now I've realized that knowing where my kids are at is way more stressful. <laughs> right here it is. The dot's moving. The dot's sitting still. The dot's been there for 10 minutes. The dot's, why is the dot going in a place it shouldn't be going? I thought we were going somewhere else. Immediately I'm like, they've been kidnapped. They're kidnapped. They're in the trunk of the car. They're heading to Ohio. I'm leaving, I'm getting my shoes on, I'm out of here, I'm meeting this car, and I'm gonna light a fire under somebody's butt, right? And all of these emotions are flying through my body, and then I hear gravel, usually with one of them, 900 miles an hour gravel coming to a screeching halt three inches from the door, and this elephant gets off my chest. I was borderline emotional crying. They walk in and I'm like, oh, hey, how's it going? <laughs> Where have you been? Oh, I don't know. I haven't been keeping track of you at all. Right? Yeah, nice to see you. Come on in. Right? It is the primary source of worry in my life. Disappointment. Disappointing my family. The primary source of worry in my life. With everything that you say or do. I told you, field full of rabbits. That's all this is in my brain. So again, working, working, working to let God just have that and go. God, Life360, take it. Get rid of it, blow up phones, please, whatever you have to do. Um, take the stress and worry away from it. Worry is the source of food for fear. It's the source of food. Fear's the tool of the devil. Uh, when God created faith, the devil created fear. When God attracts um, us, fear attracts the enemies. We live a life of what ifs. So what happens? Our worries create fear. We become afraid, and we just simply need to give that up to God. You need to believe, graduates, that you are unafraid. Choose to not fear. Trust God. Fear prevents our ability to grow, so rather than move forward, we just sit still and we exist. And we're going to have hard times. We're going to struggle. You are. God says, fear not, I'm with you and I will protect you. And it's all about having faith. Faith is basically a series of tests that he has for us to grow. 
He'll never provide you more than you can handle at any given moment. Tests are not when God is absent. It's just his choice of how he chooses to prepare you for the future. This is when we tend to provide human solutions to the tests of God. He sees our needs for tomorrow, so he starts preparing tests for you today. True faith is waiting for God's timing without knowing when. That is God's waiting room. I had an amazing experience at work. Educators are weirdos. We will go through a million bad stories. And when we have one in success, it makes us come back for the next 365 days. Um, Heather, 14 year old African American girl. I met her first when she was under the influence completely in the nurse's office. Went down and talked to her, she was not talking to me. Called her aunt and her uncle, they came in, I rode in the ambulance with her, went to the Butler Hospital, I stayed there with her, got back to school, went about my day, and just became overwhelmingly compelled to have to find a way to help Heather. The world will say that a 46 year old white guy has nothing in common with a 14, 15 year old black girl, right? So she's on a 10 day out of school suspension, board hearing. She has to plead her case to the school board, whether or not she's coming back to school. We're having the meeting, I'm coaching her up. Um, her aunt and her uncle are there and they begin to share her story. She was, uh, her mother is special needs, but could not manage. She was homeless in Louisiana for about six years, living in the streets, a lot of abuse, a lot of neglect. Aunt and uncle made the trip to Louisiana when she was 10, stole her mom and her, brought her back to Butler, where she's been, trying to just figure out her niche in life. After hearing her story and feeling compelled, I was like, we're gonna cheat, and I'm gonna tell you all the things you need to say to the school board to get yourself back here, right? That's what we're gonna do. Now we're gonna pray about it. And she's just like, what are you talking about? Like looking at me. She gets to come back. I check in with her on her 11th day back. She comes back the 12th day, sits in my office, big old smile, sits down and says, I have a question for you. I was like, what's up? She goes, is God real? Oh man, <laughs> not what I wanted to do. I said, uh, uh-huh, yep, yeah. you recording me? Like, what's, what are we doing here? <laughs> Is this you getting rid of me? How's this going down? I said, yeah. She says, you prayed for me and people haven't prayed for me before. And I've been praying for myself and something changed. I prayed for a couple things in the last day. It happened. Two or, things, two or three things that I prayed for happened. I was like, oh, that's great. I said, well, what else do we want to pray for? So she gave me a list. And she says, what am I supposed to do? I said, well, you have your phone on you? She's like, yeah. It's like, we're gonna download this Bible app and we're gonna get this. I said, cause I'm not a big fan of reading, but I love when people read to me. So I just play it and listen, right? So she does it. I introduce her to our guidance counselor who we secretly have this like relationship and faith that's spilling over to other people into the office. It's kind of a neat thing to watch. Um, and she's come down she's like, you talk to Heather? I was like, yeah, I talked to Heather. She's like, what'd you talk about? I was like, this is what I talked about. She's like, all right, I'm gonna bring down our uh, Bible school leader and we're gonna put her in the office and we're just gonna like hope that they meet down here. I was like, oh yeah, let's do that. <laughs> so I call her down, she comes out of the office, Heather's in there. I'm like, hey, could you go to Mrs. McGraw's office and grab something for me real quick? I was like, there's a student in there, just forget about it. So she walks over, it happened, right? We're connecting dots for people to see what our purpose is, what he intends us to be. They hit it off. Next thing I know, I get a picture. She's at Wednesday night youth group, rocking and rolling, telling her story. She comes in the next day. This is like a week removed. She's like, hey, I just want to let you know, uh, since you're my friend. I'm like, oh, uh -huh. we are friends now. Don't tell anybody. But she's like, in her Heatherisms, she's like, I'm writing in the Bible. I'm reading them, taking notes. I have a couple friends. Can we come and talk to you? Uh-huh. 
So she brings a couple friends. Can I have what she has? Mm-hmm. Yep, you can. So we go down, we talk to Mrs. McGraw, talk a couple more, a few more people in Bible Club. A few more people go on Wednesday night. Moral of the story is I really believe that everybody wants God. I believe it. Uh, but worries and fears prevent us from getting it. That's it. It's worries and fears. Sometimes we simply just need to start connecting the dots for ourselves and other people to really realize the true value of what God wants us to do in our lives and have intent and purpose. Graduates, I thank you for being super awesome. Really do. Um, I don't want to minimize the fact that you're graduating, but you got a rough road ahead of you. Don't worry. Give it to God. It'll be good. All things that you do, invite him into it. So as I sit here and I take inventory, right? Because that's what I do sometimes when I talk. I just look at people's faces and I'm like, is this working or is this not working? Do I need to pivot and change course? Am I too emotional? Not enough emotion? However that works. My inventory tells me is, hey, baseball guys, we're in the house today. Thank you for being here. Buy a ticket, Monday, one o'clock. Be there, support our coaches, right? Support our kids. It's gonna be a great baseball game. Most importantly, um, in typical fashion, I guess, is music is a huge motivator for me, right? I just, when I need that, I listen to music and it goes. So I was trying to think about, um, I was texting Anthony, and I'm like, ah, throw this, throw this song together for me afterwards. Um, and this is like kind of like my little gift to you. But then I was going through like a family snap and I get, I like, I try to send every morning. I'm like, hey, what's up? Love you. Have a great day. Try to do that every single day. Or if I get obsessed about a song, I'm like, boop, link it. And they're, I can only imagine what they're doing on the other end. They're like, oh my God, what's it doing? <laughs> right? So whether you're in baseball and you call this your walk-up song or whether you're in basketball and this is your warm-up song, um, just a little gift for you. But I thank you for listening to me ramble because um, that's what I felt like I did. <laughs> but um, just let them work through you. It's a good thing, it's a great experience and I appreciate it and graduates, good luck. If you need something, got it. Thanks. Please.